In the quiet town of Grand Junction, Colorado, on a seemingly ordinary summer evening in 2007, a devoted mother of three, Paige Birchfeld, vanished without a trace. But this was not your typical run-of-the-mill disappearance. No, no. This was a disappearance that would reveal a web of secrets, lies, and a horrifying truth that no one could have ever imagined. This is a story of darkness hiding behind suburban smiles. A story that begs the question, how well do you really know your neighbors? If after watching this video, you decide that you like today's story, then please hit that like and subscribe button and click all of the notifications so you don't miss any of our upcoming uploads. And if you're feeling really generous, maybe leave a comment below and let me know your thoughts on this story. I would love to read what you have to say. And last but not least, if you are curious about any of the things I've used in today's video, you can find a link to them in the description box. Okay, let's go. On the afternoon of June 28, 2007, Paige Birchfeld left her home in Grand Junction, Colorado, to meet up with her ex-husband, Howard Beegler. They had arranged to meet up together in Eagle, Colorado for a picnic. Howard lived in Denver, Colorado, and Eagle was the midpoint between Denver, where Howard lived, and Grand Junction, where Paige lived. Howard and Paige were high school sweethearts. They fell in love when they were young and got married, but because they were so young when they were married, their marriage just didn't work out, and so they divorced, like, only two years later. But now, several years later, in Paige's and Howard's mind, the past didn't equal the future, and so they thought they would give their relationship another chance. Paige, in particular, was very hopeful to rekindle some of the romance she and Howard had when they were younger. Paige was now 34. She had three kids, and she had actually been married a second time. However, that marriage ended in divorce as well. Paige's second husband was Rob Dixon, and Rob came from a very wealthy family. So wealthy, in fact, that Rob didn't need to work for a living. He had a collection of sports cars, and he lived in a million-dollar home. And when it came time for him to ask Paige to marry him, he presented her with an $85,000 engagement ring. Of course, Paige agreed to marry him, and together the couple went on to have three kids and lived a perfect life. Unfortunately, this perfect life would not last forever. Their relationship and their marriage was basically destroyed when Rob made a string of bad investments. His attitude and his behavior changed drastically from what Paige was used to, and this change eventually revealed Rob's dark side that up until that moment, he was able to keep hidden, but he couldn't hide it anymore. During one of their arguments, Paige ended up calling the police because Rob, who was supposed to watch their three children that night, informed Paige that when she came home, she was going to find that all of her children were dead. Fortunately, this ended up being an empty threat and the police did not file any charges that night, but the arguments did not stop, and it was not long before the police were called to their home again. And this time, Rob was arrested for physically assaulting Paige. The marriage had hit rock bottom, and shortly after Rob was arrested, Paige and Rob were divorced. Now that Rob was no longer living with them, Paige and her kids stayed and lived in this beautiful million-dollar house that was previously shared with Rob, and Rob moved away to Philadelphia. Paige's home in Grand Junction was extravagant, and it had a mortgage payment of $6,000 per month to prove it. This mortgage payment was now solely Paige's responsibility if she was going to keep this house. And even though she was stuck with this huge mortgage and not much help from her ex-husband, Paige was determined to make it work. She didn't want to move. She loved her kids more than anything in the world, and so she turned to her business skills to help support her family. Paige had opened 
a string of dance studios for children. She sold products for new mothers, and she was also a sales associate selling cookware for a company called Pampered Chef. And so, that Thursday, as she drove towards Eagle, Colorado, she had Howard Beagler and romance on her mind. The two met for their picnic, they had a great time, and then it was time for her to go back to her kids. Paige pointed her car in the direction of home and began the two-hour drive back to Grand Junction. Paige's three children waited anxiously for their mom to get home. She said she would be home by 11 p.m., but when she wasn't home by 11 p.m. and Paige didn't answer the phone when they tried calling her, the kids began to panic. Hi, Mom, it's me. I was just wondering when you get home. Please answer the phone. Oh, I see. Why are you leaving me? Why are you leaving me? Oh, my. End of message. You said it would be bad for Lord Darby. Why would you have been bad? Please call back quickly. Their mom had never not shown up. If she said she would be home, then she would be home, or at the very least, she would let them know she would be late. But this time... There was nothing, not a peep, and to make matters worse, the babysitter who was watching them did not speak English, and so she wasn't much of a help in the situation. And so there they sat, waiting and waiting for their mom to come home. The next day, after Paige still had not shown up at home, Paige's daughter, her oldest child, who was eight years old at that time, finally had enough of waiting around and picked up the phone and called Howard in Denver to see if her mom was still with him. Howard, hearing that Paige had not arrived home yet, was immediately concerned. Paige should have been home hours ago. And so he told Paige's daughter to have their babysitter take them to the police station right away. Once Howard was off the phone with her daughter, he picked it up again and immediately called the county sheriff. He told the sheriff that he had last spoken to Paige around 9 p.m. the previous night, which was Thursday night, the same night that they had their picnic. She had called him and said that she was just pulling into Grand Junction and she had a few people to meet up with before she went home. But he didn't know who she was meeting up with or why. And so when Paige Bergefeld had not turned up by Saturday afternoon, she was officially listed as a missing person and her family and her friends were notified. Paige's ex-husband, Howard, was quickly eliminated as a suspect when the phone records showed that he had spoken with Paige, like he had said, at 9 p.m. the night she was driving into Grand Junction. The phone records showed that Howard's phone was in Denver during that phone call. Paige's second husband, Ron, was also eliminated as a suspect immediately since he was 2,000 miles away in Philadelphia at the time of her disappearance. By that evening, there were over 150 people searching for Paige. Police had the canine unit out looking for clues. Everyone was just hyper-focused on finding this beautiful mother of three. And then, on July 1st, 2007, a call came into the police station that changed everything. The person on the other end of the phone told the police about a car that was on fire in the industrial section of town. With this news, the police quickly mobilized to the scene, and when they arrived and had a look around at the burning car, it was obvious to them that this was a case of arson. And once the fire was extinguished, and the police had an opportunity to go through what was left of the car, they were able to determine that this burned-out car belonged to Paige. It seemed as though someone was trying to get rid of evidence, and as the police were sifting through what was left of this car, they noticed a few things. First of all, they found it odd that the driver's seat of the car had been pushed all the way back since Paige was only about 5 foot 4 inches tall. She would have not even been able to reach the pedals of the car with the seat so far back, and so it was obvious that someone very tall had been driving her car. They also uncovered a day timer that was locked in the trunk of the car, which had somehow miraculously been mostly spared from the fire. But the last four pages of that day timer had been ripped out. Those four pages coincided with the past few days in which Paige had gone missing. 
For a brief moment, it seemed like the police were going to get a break in the case when a police dog picked up a scent at the car and tracked it for about 500 feet, eventually coming to a stop at a mechanic shop that serviced RVs. But unfortunately, their hopes quickly faded when the scent disappeared before finding any more clues as to what happened to Paige. And so, investigators turned and concentrated their efforts on the last activity of Paige's cell phone. On the evening that Paige went missing, they found that her last call was to Howard. But when they looked at the calls that had happened earlier in the day, they discovered something that nobody would have ever expected in a million years. When the police looked at Paige's phone records, they found that there were three incoming and two outgoing calls to one phone number. However, this phone number was not in Paige's contacts. Based on these phone calls and the voicemails the police found on Paige's phone, they discovered that Paige had a secret. Paige was living a secret life that nobody knew about, and nobody was prepared for it when it was revealed that the sweet loving mother of three was secretly running an escort business that she called Models Inc. And further to this, on the Models Inc. website, the investigators found photos of Paige, a beautiful, thin, strawberry blonde listed on the escort website under the name Carrie. Paige wanted so badly to give her kids a good life and to provide for them without losing her home. And so she turned to the high risk life of working as an escort to pay the bills and raise her three kids by herself. The police were particularly interested in the five phone calls on Paige's phone from earlier in that day. One message left on her phone from that number was from a man who called himself Jim. He had left a voicemail inquiring if Carrie was available that night. Detectives discovered that these phone calls came from a disposable prepaid cell phone, and the records for this phone showed that only five calls were ever made to or from it and they were the same three outgoing and two incoming calls that appeared on Paige's phone records. Fortunately, the police were able to track down exactly where and when this disposable phone was purchased. And they found that it was purchased just two days earlier from the local Walmart. Immediately, they acquired the surveillance video that showed this purchase, and it showed a large white male who appeared to be approximately in his 60s buying the phone. And after a bit more digging, they identified the man as Lester Jones. As it would turn out, Lester Jones worked at Bob Scott RV, the same RV repair shop just 500 feet from where Paige's car was found in flames and the same RV repair shop that the police dog had tracked a scent to from the burning car. In 1999, Lester Jones was convicted of first-degree assault and kidnapping of his own wife. He was a very tall man, and standing at six foot five inches tall, Jones would have needed to push a car seat all the way back to drive it. Based on all of the evidence that was suddenly available, the police obtained a warrant to search the RV shop where Jones worked, and there they discovered that like Paige, Lester Jones had also led a secret life of his own under the name Jim. And during the search, they found packets of Viagra, condoms, and men's toupees. They also found handwritten notes about certain escorts, including their appearance, website, personalities, types of services they would perform, and other such information. But the most damning two pieces of evidence they found were a gas canister and a food scale made by Pampered Chef the same company that Paige worked for. Police brought Jones into the sheriff's office for interrogation, where he flatly denied everything. He denied ever meeting Paige or even knowing who she was. He denied buying the phone. He denied making the calls. And then when police showed him the surveillance video, he just said it was not him on the video. When he was asked where he was on Sunday night when Paige's car was found on fire, he did admit that he had left the house saying that he went back to the RV shop to turn the shop lights off 
It was just an amazing coincidence that the car was on fire at that very moment. But despite the evidence that the police had, and besides the burning car, they could not prove that Paige had met with any foul play. There was no body. They didn't know if she was dead or alive. Maybe she had just run away. And so, unfortunately, police had no choice but to set Lester Jones free. Two weeks later, on July 16th, a motorist traveling on Highway 50 stopped to fix his flat tire. And while out there in the country on the side of the highway, this driver was looking around when he spotted something in the ditch. He walked up to the item, reached down and picked it up, and upon looking at it, he's seen that written in the top corner was the name Paige Bergefeld. It was Paige's checkbook. Police were notified of the discovery immediately, and an extensive search started of Highway 50, spreading all along the highway between Grand Junction and Whitewater, Colorado. They found over two dozen personal items belonging to Paige, including her children's medical cards. It was speculated that Paige had been kidnapped and was leaving a trail of breadcrumbs by throwing her personal items out the window of the moving vehicle. But even with this new evidence, it unfortunately was not enough to bring any charges against Jones. And because of that, the case went cold, and it sat on the shelf gathering dust for another five years. In the spring of 2012, about 40 miles south of Grand Junction, a hiker came across what was clearly a human skull. The flesh around the skull had long since decomposed, but there was still duct tape around the jawline and the back of the head. Over the course of almost a year, the Gunnison River was searched for more remains and the search turned up hundreds of bones that belonged to Paige. Paige's remains were scattered for a mile-long stretch of the river, and she was pronounced dead on March 6, 2013. It took another year and a half for prosecutors to put together a case that they believed was strong enough to convict Lester Jones. And when they had everything together and they felt that they were ready, they finally arrested him on November 20th, 2014. The first trial unfortunately ended in a mistrial because nine jurors believed Jones was guilty, but three of them still believed there was reasonable doubt. And then... A second trial started the following month. During this trial, Jones's wife was called as a witness and she testified that Lester had left the house that Sunday night when the car was found burning and she had suspected her husband of seeing other women. As the jury was deliberating, they came back with a question. They wanted the prosecution to replay a strange recorded phone conversation that they had played earlier between a police officer and Lester Jones. Here is the audio from that conversation. If you need us to bring one to you or come and pick one of you up, we can do that for you. I don't think so. I'm, Mr. Jones, I'm not following you. <coughs> you asked me for I would bury a body. I'm sorry? You asked me where I should bury a body. When did I ask you that? Almost 10 years after Paige Bergefeld went missing, Lester Jones was found guilty on all counts of kidnapping and murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So that's going to wrap it up for this video. Thank you for watching. And if you haven't already, please make sure to like and subscribe and toss a comment below. Like maybe you have a story suggestion, or maybe you want to give some feedback, or maybe you've seen a secret in the background and you want to be the first to have your comment pinned. Maybe. Whatever the case, I'd love to read what you have to say, and I will see you again later.